thinking is very important because black lives matter and all lives matter. Yes. We have a wonderful panel here to talk about um, what we as the ACLU are doing um, in the streets, in the courtrooms, and in Annapolis um, to combat police misconduct and bring police accountability. And I know that there are many people um, in the room who've been involved in this struggle for decades, um, but I want to point out Jonathan Hutto, who's in the back, um, who is a, fa a founding member with Marion Gray Hopkins um, and others of the Prince George's County Coalition for Police Accountability. Um, so our first speaker is going to be, I'm going to introduce all three and um, and we're going to have each of the speakers talk for about 10 minutes and then we want to open it up for discussion um, because we hope that this panel will become um, part of the struggle uh, to bring police accountability to Maryland. So we want to have an engaging discussion uh, and be very proactive today. Um, so first we have my friend and hero, Marianne Gray Hopkins. Who's Love you, Mary. Yeah. Who's the mother of Gary Hopkins, who was killed by the police in Prince George's County in 1999. Um, she's been a longtime advocate for police accountability reform, both locally, um, statewide, and, and nationally. And it's important, as she'll explain, to note that the a police officer in her son's case was, in fact, indicted, um, but then acquitted because uh, the prosecutors put on a very weak case. So it's important to note that uh, just because we get an indictment in a case does not mean that we have justice. It's just the first step in a long process of bringing justice. Um, after Marion, we have Delegate Alonzo Washington, um, who's a Democrat from Prince County, who was elected last fall to represent District 22. He has a degree in criminal justice from the University of Maryland, and he championed police accountability reform in Annapolis, he was the lead sponsor of House Bill 954, which will require police departments to report to the state civilian deaths as a result of police encounters. Um, and finally, we have our own Tony Holness, who's the public policy associate of the ACLU of Maryland. Good evening, everyone, and first of all, let me thank Meredith Curtis and the ACLU for this opportunity to share my son's story. Um, I've told the story a thousand times, so you guys have to forgive me if you've heard the story before. But I wanted to give you some background information on my son, Gary Hopkins. Um, again, I am the mother of Gary Hopkins, who was murdered on November 27, 1999, at the early age of 19, by Prince George's County Police Officers Brian Catlett and Devin White. Um, Gary, just to tell you a little bit about him, he was smart, he was talented, he had a great sense of humor. I mean, he came in a room he just with his smile, he just liked the room up. I mean, a wonderful, wonderful kid. Not only because I'm saying, because he's my son, but he was truly a great child. Um, he was in his second year of college. He had his first year, um, he was at Johnson C. Smith in North Carolina, and being a mommy's boy, um, he was very... Um, missing mom so he wanted to come back home and he started his second year at PG Community College because there were some credits he had to take before he was able to transfer to Towson State. Um, to set the stage for what happened to my son, 16 days prior um, to my son's killing, my husband of 22 years died of bone cancer. Um, Gary was very upset. Him and his dad were like two peas in a pod and he was very upset. He was also working a little part-time job, which was directly across the street from the fire station where he was at the night of his killing. Gary, um, supervisor, hosted a dance at the local fire station then in Lanham, Maryland, which is part of Prince George's County. And he told Gary, he said, this may be a great opportunity for you to get out and you know, spend some time with you know friends, dance a little bit, just have some fun. That thinking it would get his mind off of the loss of his dad just 16 days prior. So Gary was pretty excited about it. So he called his friends, he called his cousins, he even tried to get me to go. Of course, I wasn't hanging out with the youngins. So he um, got everybody together, and that morning before I um, left for work, because I went right back to work after my husband's death, 
he asked to borrow my car. Then he says, Mom, Dad had some new shoes, you know, that he had some lizard shoes he had never worn. I'm wearing those tonight, you know, in memory of Dad. So he said, but I need the credit card because I got to give me some really nice slack. So he took my card. He, you know, called me and said, I got this outfit, Mom. I'm all ready. So, again, that night he had his friends and some of his cousins. They went to the dance at the local fire station. Well, at, towards the end of the dance, um, an altercation broke out between one of Gary's friends and another party goer. And Gary was like a mentor to his age group. People always thought he was older. You know, if you didn't know any better, you thought he may have been a bad kid because he would bring the bad ones home, and his dad and him would mentor these kids. So one of his friends got into an altercation, and like I said, with another party goer, and Gary broke up the fight. He got everybody into their respective cars. Well, Gary was in the lead vehicle, and Gary was a jokester. So he's sitting, this is in November now, he's sitting with his legs dangling outside of the windowsill of the car, waving everyone on. And as they tried to, he was getting back and getting ready to get back into the vehicle when an officer, Officer Devin White, blots them from exiting. Devin White's get out of his vehicle, comes up to the car where Gary is. He's suited down this night. He wants, you know, being impressed. He had his dad's new shoes on and everything. Grabs Gary by the collar of his shirt with the gun to his temple. Pulls him off the car. Gary stumbles forwards trying to get his balance. And um, another officer, Officer Brian Catlett, makes one gunshot to Gary's chest. <clears throat> they alleged later that someone in the crowd said that there was a weapon in the vehicle. After in, you know, investigating and searching the vehicle, there was no weapon, there was no alcohol, there was no drugs. Gary had a friend that was there that night, a female friend, that tried to render aid. They pulled him from her arms as she tried to apply pressure to his chest, drug him to the side of the road, and let him lay there to die. I got the, that, that phone call, of course it just broke my heart, there's no way. You know, I just lost my husband. You know, this can't be happening to me. I made my way down, which was just minutes away from the house. I made my way down. By the time I got there, there was the, you know, the police tape everywhere. And I, you know, announced myself who I was. I need to see my child. I heard my child was, had been shot. And they said, sorry, ma'am. I had to take an alternate route to where I could have ran minutes, maybe not even minutes, because the hospital where they took him, um, on Good Luck Road was just steps away. And so I had to take an alternate route to get to the hospital to be met by the police officers to tell me my son's body is, is evidence. You will not be able to, to see your son. And I'm there, I'm emotional, I'm crying, and I'm thinking, oh God, no, don't let him be dead. And I am probably from here to where Jonathan Hutto is to view my son's body. Um, after that, of course, you know, Gary died that, that night. So I was notified by that time, at that time, State's Attorney Jack Johnson. Um, well, let me step back for a minute. That night, the eyewitnesses that were there were taken down to the police station, and they were told they had to give a statement that very night. Well, you, as you all know, a, a police officer gets 10 days to give his statement. During that 10 days, the police officer and his attorney can get access to the written statements from the witnesses. To me, it definitely lays um, the groundwork for them to corroborate a story around uh, what the witness has stated. To me, there's definitely an opportunity for reform, and that's one of the things that the ACLU and others that are in this room are working towards the reform of the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. They, we're, that's all we're asking for is a level playing field. We're not asking for anything more. We're asking for fairness. So, you know, I talked to Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson, after reading the witnesses' statements, felt very strongly that this death was unwarranted <coughs> and went on to indict one of the officers, the officer that made the fatal shot, but did not indict the officer who pulled my son off the car, precipitated the event. So I'm feeling good about it in the very beginning. I'm thinking, okay, well, we got an indictment. But again, as Stephanie has said, it's not about the indictment. The indictment is just a first step. We need convictions when these police officers wrongfully kill our unarmed children. We went to trial. We spent five days in a trial. Um, 
we had um, the two days prior to the trial, which is the officer's um, right, he went for a judge trial versus jury trial. We sat there in that courtroom with testimony that we know should have convicted this officer. We had evidence that was not allowed by the judge. The judge, you know, was there. He was asleep most of the time. He would not allow evidence to be admitted into testimony without any explanation. For example, the coroner's report that said, based on the trajectory of the wound, my son's arms had to be up. It was not allowed in testimony. My son witnessed these same two officers beating someone and was scheduled to testify against them. He was not allowed to testify without any explanation. So again, we sat there in that courtroom for five days for the judge to say, you know, after closing arguments, I've heard enough, I'll be back after lunch with my decision. Of course, he was acquitted on the manslaughter charges. And just to step back for just a minute, we talk about the Internal Affairs Division, where we have police policing themselves. Yeah. There is definitely a need for reform there. We know that there is camaraderie amongst the police officers. We know that that is that blue wall of silence amongst them and that they know that they will be on a black list if they come out and rap against their own. There definitely needs to be change. One of the other things we need, we need civilian review boards with civilians with complete subpoena power. Yes. So these are the things that we need to be fighting for if we are to stop the unjust killing of our children. So I ask of you that you come forward and that you be along with me and others in this room to say enough is enough. Um, and we know that there's been a recent high visibility on police killings. But we know for decades, as Meredith mentioned, this has been going on. We can go back, as my son, almost 16 years. We have now the visibility. We have the Eric Garners. We got the Michael Browns. We have the Freddie Grays. We've got the Walter Stotts. But I'm here. There's a mother in this room today, comforts whose son was killed in Silver Spring that didn't get the visibility and has not received justice. Comfort, could I ask you to stand, please? So, I mean, Comfort is out there on the front line fighting for justice for her son, Emmanuel, uh, pronounce it for me. Okotuga. Okotuga. So we're, he's fighting for justice there. There's mo other mothers in here in the Maryland area that are also fighting. We have for Dorothy Elliott, who is still fighting. We have Darlene Kane out of Baltimore. You don't hear about Darlene Kane's story of her son, Dale Graham, who was brutally murdered. You don't hear about him. You don't hear about the Christopher Browns in Baltimore. So it's like the focus gets on only those high profile cases with the high visibility. But behind the scenes, there are many people being killed. As Meredith said, there were 109 killings of unarmed people between the year 2010 and 2014. And of those 109, 69% were unarmed people of color when we only make up 29% of the population here in Maryland. What's wrong with that picture? But there's not a problem here in, in the state of Maryland as recently stated, especially in Prince George's County, where just recently in Oxon Hill there was an artistic picture placed up where kids are seeing that this is what they're seeing, this is what they're feeling that there is an officer, white officer, and I don't think it's white officers, I don't think it's a race thing, white officers, even though there are many of them, it's the officers in blue against black, okay? And these kids put up what they see, and that's their First Amendment right, they should have been able to do just that. And then just recently, in the legislative uh, session, there were, I think, upward of 25 bills in the Senate and the House that would have addressed the, needed, the need for reform. They were all voted down. In final closing, I just want to say, my son loved to write, and in his final paper, he wrote, How It Takes a Village to Bring About Change. And this issue requires a village. Okay? I ask, I will ask that you don't sit silent. Silence to me means consent to the status quo. 
we can make a difference. So be a part of the village. Reach out to your legislators. Let them know that we're no longer going for this. We're not going to vote them if, in if they're not going to do the right thing. And ask them to vote favorable. When these bills are reintroduced in the upcoming legislative session, ask them to vote favorable. And if they don't, blast them out. Yes. Call them out. Yes. If they don't. I mean, there's many rallies, there's marches, there are town halls. Our voices need to be heard. People need to know across this country. It's not an issue just in Ferguson. There's an issue right here in the state of Maryland for a very, very long time that needs to be addressed. If we're going to get the justice for the victims and their families and that there is greater um, accountability for these police officers, we need to do the right thing. I'm here as a voice for my son, I am a voice for Comfort, I am a voice for Darlene, I am a voice for Donnie Elliott, I am a voice for Chris Brown, and I'm here to say that we cannot, and please do not, let our son's deaths be in vain. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much, Mary Gray Hopkins. Our next speaker is Delegate Washington. Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 How are you guys doing? Hi. All right. uh, can we please give a round of applause for Mary and Gray, please, for the sacrifice she's made and going across our state foundation. I uh, really appreciate that. And not only are you a voice for um, those, those young men that you spoke of, but you're a voice for mothers who care and who have been working hard like my mother who raised me of a, of, a, of a single household of six kids. And I appreciate the work that you're doing and speaking for moms out there. So thank you for your service. I really appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> so for me, uh, my name is Alonzo Washington. For those who don't know me, I represent District 22 here in Prince George's County, uh, which uh, you are in Greenbelt. Uh, this is the great city of Greenbelt here at New Deal Cafe. We welcome you. Uh, for those who don't live in Prince George's or don't live in, uh, in, uh, in District 22, but I represent University Park, Riverdale Park, Hydesville, Lanham, and New Carrollton, and several other areas uh, in, the, in Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, our legislative session concluded a couple months ago uh, as a new New state le le legislator and leader of the Maryland's Legislative Black Caucus. I'm the first vice chair of the Legislative Black Caucus of Maryland. I'm also uh, the chair of the Law Enforcement Subcommittee of Prince George's County as well. We oversee the state's attorney's uh, bills. We oversee the liquor licensing police department uh, here in Prince George's County. Uh, any bills that come through, I would be I would be the chair of that committee that oversees those bills and tries to put we try to push those bills out. Um, unfortunately. Uh, we didn't have one single police accountability bill locally, uh, not one. Um, I proposed one that I drafted one that um, I want to I want to say it wasn't a conspiracy, uh, but they didn't. But the drafters didn't get it to me in time enough for it to make our um, our deadline. Uh, it was a it was a uh, it was a bill looking at the cameras, uh, police body cameras, and we weren't able to get that out. But good enough, our police department has been moving forward with looking at how we can start implementing police cameras uh, here in Prince George's County, which is a, a great step forward. Um, and we in the in the legislative black caucus, we work really hard to reform our criminal justice system in hopes that we can simplify simply uh, just make it fair for uh, a lot of minorities, a lot of black kid, a lot of black folks, and and just as as Marion mentioned level the playing field and that's a significant that's significantly what we wanted to do uh, in the House of Delegates and for the Black Caucus um, we were we were looking at data all year that uh, that we spent 228 million dollars incarcerating people in Baltimore City alone um, the, the that over a hundred civilians died at the hands of police officers over the past five years according to the ACLU report um, and that and that over of that of that uh, over a hundred people 109 to be exact 70% um, of those civilians were black and 41% of those were actually unarmed citizens so we significantly have a problem here here and here, here in the state of Maryland so last September, what I decided to do, just looking at all the issues that are occurring around the, around the country and trying to figure out how many people actually die in the hands of police officers around the country. There's no one single database in the state of Maryland, in the state of Maryland or in the nation that you can find that's, that's, that's generated by the government that you can find that says that this is how many people died, this is the racial breakdown, these are disparities that occur. You don't see that nowhere in our nation right now. Because of the bill that I propose, HB 954, which will require all local and state police departments in, in, in the state of Maryland to, to give to the governor's office of crime and prevention the, the number, the, the, 
I'm just going to say the age and gender, ethnicity, and race of the deceased individual. That same information for the officer involved. A brief description of the circumstances surrounding the death, uh, the date, time, and location of death, and the law enforcement agency of the officer who detained the arrest or was in the process of arresting the deceased. Uh, that's information that we don't know. That's information that we need to know now. And because of this bill, because of the governor decided to sign this bill, uh, we're very, I'm very proud that we actually have that done because that's a big step in the right direction. So uh, I'm very happy that we got that through. So with that said, the other, the other bills that we proposed, as, as Mary mentioned, we proposed a host of bills last year uh, that would, well this year in the, in the legislative session, that would, that would look at police accountability specifically. Unfortunately, this General Assembly decided not to move forward on, the, on these issues. Uh, this General Assembly decided that it wasn't time, that we needed more time to push things through, we needed more time to look at things, and I disagreed. I disagreed wholeheartedly because like, the time is now. Although this isn't Ferguson, this is Baltimore City, this is Prince George's County, this is Montgomery County, this is the state of Maryland where we have a high percentage of minorities uh, here in those in those urban areas where the majority of those police, are, of those police force are majority white. We have we don't have the level playing field that we need in order to make sure that the that in order to make sure our criminal justice system is fair and just for everybody. So we propose those pieces of legislation to ensure that when when someone it dies in the hands of police officers, that our state's attorney will no longer have a have a have a, this have oversight and review of those laws because they they work hand in hand with our police departments hand in hand with our police departments. They receive donations from our from the labor unions of these police departments. They work hand in hand. I can't fault them for, for working hand in hand because they have to. It's just with the way the system is set up. So I don't blame any individual any individual state's attorney. I just think we need we have a flawed system. And this flawed system has led to too many people getting off around our nation. And in this in this state, we're gonna we're gonna push next year to ensure that our our state prosecutor who, 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 who investigates us as elected officials for ethical issues and independent person. We're gonna look at having, making sure they do the investigations as well. So that there's a third party who's looking at this investigation and ensuring that there's a thorough, transparent investigation on that, on that homicide. And I proposed that bill last year along with other delegates. So I like this, I'm, I'm just so disappointed in last year's legislative session that we weren't able to get this done. You know, we hear so many times that if you, you know, the government doesn't move fast enough if there is a, when someone, when you, when some people, when people keep planning, well, we need speed bumps on this street, we need speed, we need, we need more traffic calming devices on this street, and then nothing's going to happen until somebody dies, and then somebody dies, and then the government reacts. That's what happened in this case with Freddie Gray. That the government, that the government said that no, it's not the time. Nothing has happened anymore, and then the government now wants to take a reaction. They want to, they want to create a commission, looking at, oh yeah, let's look at the police accountability bills now. Let's get 20 legislators together and look at these issues now. I think that's too late. I think that we need to, we should have done that in the session. And on top of that, I think that we need to we need to make sure that not only are they looking at these police accountability bills, police accountability measures, but they, we need there are social issues that are occurring in our cities and in our urban areas that need to be addressed. That commission is not looking at that. That's not going to solve those problems that are happening in Baltimore City and even here inside the Beltway of Prince George's County. It's not going to solve those issues, and I want to see us look at it further. So we 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 uh, at the, as a Black Caucus, I asked them that we convene our own committee to look at police accountability bills, but also to look at, but also to look at the social and economic issues that are occurring within our, within our jurisdiction, that we can not start giving kids jobs, we can start having wraparound services at our, at, at our schools, and we can start really making significant change in our communities. And that's what's gonna happen to make, this, to make sure that we don't have another Freddie Gray. We need a comprehensive approach. It's not gonna just take police accountability for things to happen. So with that said, I mean, I, I am discouraged that I am, uh, I'm encouraged that we took a step in the General Assembly just a little bit uh, with this commission. I'm encouraged that the, that, this, that the Black Caucus of Maryland has started to convene itself and look at, look at more police accountability bills, but also look at a comprehensive approach to, to, um, to rectifying the issues that are, that are plaguing our communities like poverty and education. And we need to make sure that we do the right things on behalf of the Freddie Grays and all of these communities 
uh, that are hit with poverty. Uh, so with that said, I also want to, before I, before I close, I wanted to make sure I introduce Ryan from Senator Cardin's office, who's here with us uh, today. And Gary, uh, he wasn't introduced earlier, from Progressive Maryland, who's here with us today as well. So I wanted to make sure I introduce him. But I'm, I'm fired up. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to get some things done. And I'm work, ready to work side by side with ACLU to get it done. I'm going to work side by side to make sure that we actually make some change to, have, to have, make some change here in Maryland for the Freddie Grays of our community and for the mothers who are really looking after our look, really looking after our young black men as best as they can. So thank you for this opportunity, and I want to thank the ALC, ACLU for making for allowing me to be a part of this too. Thank you. everyone and uh, you know before I begin my remarks the first thing I have to say is thank you to the delegate Washington and Marion uh, this is really this is this is the magic formula right here right you know people always ask you know how do you get things um, changed in Annapolis and, and this is what you need you need um, a fired up citizen who and you know Marion she tells the story of um, the loss of her son with such grace and such eloquence, but it's hard. And she's told it a lot, and I've heard her, um, you know, give testimony. And she comes down to Annapolis, and it is a long day, let me tell you. Um, made even longer by a poorly run uh, committee, the Judiciary Committee. Um, sorry. Yeah, I know these are your colleagues here. <laughs> 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 so thank you for being here. <laughs> Today, Marion, but also thank you for all the work you did um, from January Street back through March and in the past 15 years, and the work you'll continue to do. Uh, Delegate Washington, I have to tell you, people, uh, was in the committee room, the Senate committee room, while they were voting his bill. This man was standing guard. Okay, <laughs> you know, um, the, the the General Assembly, as you heard, entertained uh, upwards 20 or so bills uh, concerning police accountability. And you know, and the bills really range from calling for a special prosecutor, uh, making changes to the Baltimore Civilian Review Board. Um, body cameras were discussed in a number of pieces of legislation, uh, and you know, really, so you know, there was really no lack of creativity, um, and there were there was no lack of options. The legislature really had a very lengthy menu to choose from, right? And what you may have heard is this argument or this uh, suggestion that, well, you know, things were sort of um, in disarray and there was not a lot of cohesion. Uh, but, you know, do not be uh, distracted by that, you know, because it is very, very often the case that there are different, different bits of legislation that are introduced uh, to give the legislators options and for them to make an educated decision about how to move forward. Maybe you take a piece of this bill, maybe you take a piece of that bill, but somehow you call together something that would work. And they failed to do that in large part this year, with the exception of really a handful of bills. Delegate Washington's bill was one of the few that weathered the storm, if you will, and it's an important measure. Um, we, only yesterday, uh, uh, you know, I feel like we've gone through war together. We <laughs> sat through a work group um, which was assembled to uh, implement this reporting measure to have law enforcement report on the deaths in custody. You've heard about the report that we put out earlier this year, but the, the onus should not be on the ACLU to put out a report for the public to know this very important information, right? And so what uh, Delegate Washington's bill does is it will force law enforcement to report on this information because in fact they are the holders of the information, right? Um, and the most perfect information should come from them. Ideally, so um, so we're thankful for Delegate Washington for um, his bravery, really, in um, in leading that struggle. You know, so since the legislative session has ended, uh, we have really been trying to be introspective in deciding, you know, where where do we go from here, right? Because it's easy to sort of feel really discouraged and. Um, almost like you had the wind knocked out of you because the energy that we saw going into legislative session, really, it felt formidable. It just felt like there's no way we cannot get something. And yet, you know, and, then, and yet it's just such a huge letdown. But this, well, we, we don't have the luxury of being so discouraged, 
month, right? Because this, you know, we are, we have to go through it, right? And we'll be back next year stronger and bolder and louder <laughs> than we were last year. More of us. And more of us. That's right. You know, so um, you know, right now the momentum for police accountability is really lying with people like Marion, people like Comfort, who are bringing their personal experiences to the fore. And our role, uh, we feel at the ACLU, is to elevate those voices and to make sure that you know we are lending and leveraging the resources that we have to um, to support com the community movement. That is that is, and I'm not even going to say um, forging because, as Marion mentioned, you know people have been working on this for a long time, and it's really just sort of you know. Thank goodness that you know folks are paying attention now, right? So, uh, so that's what we'll be doing um, in the next few in the next few months. Really trying to figure out how we're going to move forward and how we're going to be how we are going to be the most useful and most helpful that we can be to the advocates who have been doing this and it is their life's mission to um, to get police accountability. Um, we're looking at about four categories of reforms. So, um, Marion mentioned the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights. Uh, it is rife with um, opportunities for misuse. I, we, we have heard directly from chiefs and uh, you know higher ups in law enforcement that in fact the Leobor is is a huge barrier to accountability. And you know the, you know it may be that this is an opportunity for alliance between the advocates and the chiefs who who you know maybe they do want to hold their um, rank and file officers accountable. So we'll be looking at the Leo War. We're also looking at civilian oversight and different models, right? There, um, you know, there's the an inspector general model, and there are different ways that uh, civilian oversight can be can be fashioned. And we, you know, it's not just about accountability when things go awry. You know, there needs to be civilian oversight over just the everyday police harassment of the same folks who get stopped and first arrested. Um, not just foot stops, but traffic stops as well. So there needs to be some oversight over, you know, just the from the hiring to the training, and and to on the back end to enforceability uh, when things do go awry. Um, the other thing that we're going to be looking at is just this dragnet policing. So really looking at what effect. So you know we've been working on marijuana reform. Um, so we're looking at, you know, which laws are being used uh, or abused rather. To really just to, to make pretextual stops, to you know have interactions with individuals when they're really not necessary. How are people being swept up and entangled with the criminal justice system unnecessarily? So we're also looking at uh, declassifying or reclassifying our criminal laws. So those are sort of four buckets of area. But you know, uh, I, I feel the sense of discouragement. But you know, we are with discouragement. There's also sort of energy, and we are. Um, Rechanneling it. Is that appropriate? Yes, we're rechanneling. Come on, <laughs> uh, you know. Um, and if any anyone is interested in getting involved, please do not be shy, because we have plenty of work to go around. Thank you. Before we open it up to uh, questions from the audience, um, I'd like you all to just sort of present a picture of what the hearings look like in Annapolis, and in the spirit of forging positive energy as a result of the negativity that we all experience in Annapolis, um, if you could also talk about some of the barriers, why when many of the people in this room um, went to Annapolis, called their legislators, um, we have all these cases in the news nationally, why um, were these bills not even voted on many of them? If you could just paint the picture in Annapolis and talk about why um, things went so poorly, and maybe um, how some ideas on how we can do it differently next year. I just want to make a comment because I sat in there all day long. We got there at nine in the morning, and they didn't even hear our bills until probably eight p.m. at night. And I think one of the biggest things through this process that I'm learning is that a lot of these delegates, and hopefully you're not one of them. <laughs> um, you, I mean, you introduced the bill, so hopefully not. But they are funded by the, the FOP. And I mean, they were so deep 
in that room, it was only standing room for those of us who wanted them to vote favorable for these bills. We had to stand because they intimidated the heck out of us in that in, in that room. But from my perspective as a civilian and as a mother who lost her child, I think the FOP plays a huge role. So, you know, we met at my home the other day, the People's Coalition for in Prince George's County, and we talked about what are some of the ways and what are some of the things that we can do differently. And like I mentioned, call them out. We're going to say that we need you to vote favorable for this bill, and if they don't, we're going to blast you. <laughs> so first, uh, <laughs> no, you're, you're, look, you're absolutely right. I think a lot of us are funded by the FOP and, you know, they, we, you have fundraisers and you're looking to, you know, get as much money as you can so you can do the proper outreach in your community and, and sometimes the police department, I mean, look, our police department, many of them and most of our police officers do a great job and try to do the right things uh, by the system. but. I gotta tell you that um, I'm not funded by the FOP at all. <laughs> at all. I'll, I'll send their check out. If you were, you wouldn't be for long. <laughs> no, I cannot. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, I've made I've made many of my funders uh, upset uh, by doing some. I'm very progressive, and I believe in issues that I believe in. And no one's going to turn me around. Not money. Not anything. I'm going to do the right thing by my people. And people are going to and not only that, but I mean, look, our FOP, our FOP was against all of my bills, all of, all of them, all of them. I mean, they 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 tried to they try to water down as much as they could uh, this simple reporting bill. I mean, for accountability measures, they try to water it down. And uh, even my state attorney's bill uh, to, the, for the state prosecutor, they didn't like it at all. But now, when Marilyn Mosby comes out and she says that, look, I don't want to, I don't, I'm, I'm having a fair, independent investigation. Now they want to say, no, we want to, want somebody else who's independent. We want somebody else. But I don't, no, look, it's, 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 it's these folks. They have a powerful uh, union. People are endorsed by them. They have a powerful um, lobbying unit, and they, they send people out. But the best thing we can do is be an even more powerful lobbying unit. And following the ACLU, and because they know, they know single-handedly when a bill is about to die, when a bill is about to do something. And they notify us because sometimes we're not in those rooms all the time. Especially my bills, I'm not on, not on the judiciary committee, so I lean, I lean to them to keep, to keep me abreast of some of the things. And even my colleagues on the judiciary too, who, lean, who I lean on to make sure that those things happen. But we need to, we need to meet with legislators. You need to meet with them ahead of time. We need to meet with them now. We need to send messages to them now that this is important to us. You know, the conservative Democrats as well as the progressive Democrats, and even some of the Republicans who also believe that we need to, we, we do need, there is some need for uh, police accountability. They get that. Many people voted, many Republicans voted for my bill. Uh, many people, many Republicans try to hold it off. But we have to get into those offices and let them know, like, this is, we need this to happen. We need this to happen, and we need to have a, a, a organized front on how we can get this through. Because their lobbying unit, they have more money than us. They have more, they have more influence in the legislature because of their money. And if we're going to do it, we have to get ahead of them. Uh, we have to get in front of this ahead of time before the legislative session starts. And we need to make sure they know, the police department knows. Look, I was just at an event just now, and one of their lobbyists came to me and said, "Well, we should talk." We should talk. But yeah, I understand you had a lot of these uh, police bills last year. And I was like, well, yeah, I'm going to have a lot of them next year, too. So <laughs> well, so we can talk about it, definitely. No problem. No problem, absolutely. So so with that said, just to answer your question, we need to we need to get ahead of this ahead of time. And we need to be, we need to get in that, we need to get in those offices of many of these delegates, whether they're Republican or Democrats or conservative Democrat. We need to really get ahead of the game. So thank you. When Stephanie asked a question about um, why things get held up, the first thing I, I leaned over to Delegate Washington and I said, well, it starts with V and it ends in Illyria. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, listen, you know, the reality is that the General Assembly is very leadership dominated, um, for whatever that means to you. And it's not just the committee. Um, it's the leadership of the General Assembly. And so when the Delegate mentioned um, meeting with folks, it's important that you uh, that we target the folks who have the most influence, right? Um, and, the, and 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 they're not they you know um, it is not 
a matter of getting behind the pearly gates. There are real people, they, you know, live on our streets and there's no reason why we should not have access to them and, you know, have access to them and try to access them uh, during the interim when, you know, they don't have a million meetings a day, when they're not in the middle of session. So, you know, the moment is not, the moment was really like yesterday. And so, you know, uh, meeting with leadership because here in Maryland, uh, you know, you, you got to get the speaker and the Senate president and the chairs of the committee on board. Uh, even if you have the votes on on the committee, you could have um, all the, you know, enough co-sponsors of a bill on committee and your bill will still die. And that's because the bill just gets put in the drawer. And so if you uh, do not have a, if you do not have the chairs of the committees uh, on your side, it is a it is an obstacle that is very difficult to surmount. Uh, the other thing is, you know, it's not that there's legislative inertia, but it, there, it's a very risk averse group, especially because there's so many new delegates and senators that it's you know it's um it's very difficult sometimes for legislators uh, like Delegate Washington to to be a lone voice out there when there the pr the pressure the overwhelming pressure is let's try and do as little as possible and say we did something you know um, so to get something substantive passed like Delegate did uh, really you know it takes um, enormous bravery um, so you know insofar as you can support legislator in addition to meeting with the leadership and the decision makers and the powers that be support the legislators who are going out on a limb to uh, to try and get some things changed. And just to comment on that, it's it's pretty despicable that it requires bravery in Maryland to count how many police deaths we had in custody. Um, not to take anything away from Delegate Washington, but it shouldn't be controversial. Um, so uh, if you have, a, Mr. Hutto has a question, stand up and oh, say your name. I don't, you do please, there's a microphone right up Oh, yeah, <laughs> Unless you're really He's loud. He's pretty loud. <laughs> well, first and foremost, thanks, thanks to the panel, thanks to the ACLU specifically. Uh, everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Am I good? Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Good. And uh, specifically, uh, Stephanie Marion, uh, Washington, Brother Washington. I got about Alonzo Washington. And uh, Sister Tommy Holden, we talked we talk to them all many times. Uh, before I ask my question, one thing I want to say is that this, this thing about being discouraged. Um, this is the most, I've, I've been engaged with this movement for the most part. There's been some ups and downs, right? If, if you're a movement worker, there's ebbs and flows, right? I've seen this thing for a little over 15 years. This is the, this is the most uh, accomplishment I've seen at the legislative level ever. Okay, mm -hmm. so while there's this discouragement about what you actually got from Annapolis, I mean, Stephanie can talk about a time when we went to Annapolis for a special prosecutor bill in 2000, it was no movement at all. I mean, we were actually sitting in Glenn Denning's office having to sit in just to get a hearing about the issue. The next year, in 2001, Mary could talk about going to, you know, try to get Leopold reform, and that was for Sharon Baker's bill at that time. He was a delegate at the time. No movement at all. It was just an introduction. No movement at all. So there has been some movement, and it's because of the people's movement. Okay. So one of the questions I want to put out is that and it's not a question. It's really a perspective, and have the panel address it. Is I've always been one as an organizer to say that a legislative strategy is just that. It's a strategy. But it shouldn't be the sole strategy. And the reason why I say that is because the reason why this movement is really taking off is because citizens like you, right, all of us have that power within ourselves. We got cell phones now, video cameras, cameras, everything. I mean, what happened in South Carolina, that, that vicious case. Back in high school, the Rodney King case, that really started it all, right? Now we can see what's taking place. So I think one of the things I want to put forth as a perspective to the panel is in what ways can we, in building that people's movement, the People's Coalition for Police Accountability is one model, but building a movement where every citizen, regardless of whether you're a politician, you can introduce a bill, what have you, when the legislative season is done, because it's over right now, a strategy, not the strategy, what are some of the things that we can engage in on a legal basis? Mm -hmm. Thinking about Van Jones and that 
cop watch out of San Francisco a couple years back. That was very effective. What are some things we can engage in that can bring empowerment to the people? And sign me up for it. Thank you. <laughs> Is there someone who has more information about the ACLU app on the phones? I know that the Meredith. Meredith. <laughs> and one one important perspective that um, Marion didn't mention um, is that there have been lawsuits for decades against the Prince George's County Police, in particular. Johnny Cochran was actually Marion's lawyer, so we have sued the Prince George's County Police and over decades um, receive settlements of millions of dollars. Um, we've had some criminal indictments on the federal and, so, and uh, state level. Um, Stephanie Moore went to prison for her canines on the federal level. Um, so, so certainly the, the multi-pronged strategy with People's Coalition, criminal convictions, civil suits, and legislative is, is just a start, but it's been um, a process for years that Unfortunately, it has made some changes, but hasn't addressed um, the overall police accountability issue. So, Meredith, I don't know if that works. Yes, this works. I'll take two bikes. <laughs> um, I did want to say we have gotten so many requests for the ACLU mobile justice app, which has been launched all across the country. Um, it's coming, and we should have it available for everyone by the end of July. Um, and what that is, for those who don't know, it's an app um, that you can download for Apple and Android on your phone, and it facilitates taking video of police interactions on the street and filing directly to us intakes of what the situation is that is going on in that encounter. And it goes to our legal staff and we will um, be reviewing those videos that are sent in to us with the survey. Um, a lot of times people use them, um, but we're going to be letting people know that when they, when it comes through with um, specific information about the situation that's occurring in the video itself, we will, we will be looking at those. So it's coming very, very soon, and it's very easy to use. It will also include know your rights information for police encounters in both English and Spanish. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to answer every question. So no, uh, I think you know. Look, I, and just speaking of the multi-pronged approach, you know, I think we are taking it. We are taking a step forward. The the General Assembly is setting up the, their own commission, which is a good step. The the Legislative Black Caucus is setting up our own our own internal commission to review bills and propose bills for next year too. Uh, I know the ACLU is going to do a great job in this app. I actually saw a, a, a commercial of it on Facebook or something that I thought was pretty cool. Uh, but I think people are engaged right now. I think uh, through social media we see this all the time that there is something new happens. I mean, there's something else that happens is quickly on social media and it's quickly shared and we're all engaged. I mean, even as young as uh, middle schoolers who understand and see this and see this is yeah. happening. I mean, we see kids who are engaged down in Oxenhill High School who, who, who posted something in the, in, in the middle of their school and said, look, we understand what's happening right now. And, but to, and at, uh, at Parkdale High School in my district, uh, they, they're constantly, uh, they're constantly having a, uh, not riots, what is it called? Um, uh, demonstrations. demonstrations, thank you. They're constantly, they're constantly having demonstrations at their school right now. And they're, con they're, they're engaged. Our young people are engaged. These are people who really, care, who really care about these issues and understand that they can be targeted too at some point. And they want to, they want to, they want to make sure that their, their, student, their, other, their students uh, understand that, you know, this is what can happen. Let's make sure that police understand that we're going to hold them accountable. And we, we need more police accountability. And I'm sure the police understands that too, that there is more accountability that, that's necessary in our system. And people are engaged and ready, and I think we're, we're ready for change. We're ready right now for change. So. I know I should be answering the question, but I just have a question. You know, we talk about police in the, back in the communities getting involved. 
And um, just curious to know from an ACLU perspective, or Delegate Washington, from your perspective, um, with your interactions with police officers, do you feel they're open to having interactions, having community meetings? You know, I remember, don't want to tell my age, but you know, I remember back in the day when Officer Friendly came into the schools, yeah. you know, and we truly looked at the police officers as someone that would serve and protect us. And now our kids are scared of them. So how do you feel about that approach? I mean, do you think that would work? You know, what's been interesting is that, you know, in just sort of one-on-one -on -one casual conversations with rank-and-file officers, uh, the story is a little bit different than what you'll hear from the sort of institution of the FOP, right? Uh, and folks, uh, when, they are, they don't, when they don't feel quite so beholden to the institution mission and the, um, the talking points of the FOP, they are they're really are just a lot more open. I can't tell you how many times when we were pushing for marijuana dec decriminalization last year, I would talk to law enforcement officers and they'd say, we don't want to waste our time doing this. This is not why I signed up to take that oath to be a law enforcement officer. And yet, the position of the institution as a whole was the post, right? So, you know, I think it's a matter of the same way we try to support uh, the delegates in the legislature and the senators, we also have to sort of, you know, lend our support where we can to those law enforcement officers who can apply some pressure from within, you know. Um, so that's, you know, that's just a, uh, but I think, I think you're, you're right, you know, um, the, the, the facade or the, the exterior is a very cold and hard exterior and one that seems very uncompromising. I just wanted, I mean, I wanted to mention because I know that about the camaraderie and I just wanted to know where they are today because I will tell you that I can't even begin to count the number of letters, email that I got from police officers telling me that my child was wrongfully killed, but not one would stand forward or come forward to share that or to say that. So that's why I bring the question up. Where are we today? I don't have a lot of interactions with them. But just, I wanted to know, where, because back then they dare not come forward because of being blackballed. I know that we can um, ask questions up here. Question for all of you. <laughs> question for every single person in this room. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, who did you vote for? <laughs> so, uh, you know, look, I. I think it, I think it's important to have a conversation with our police department and see why aren't they why aren't they in our schools? We do have a police we do have a SRO um, a student resource officer in all of our high schools in Prince all of our high schools in Prince George's County that interact one on one or uh, individually with our um, with our students. But I think they should take it a step further. So I have a bill for that next year. Um, and I do think there needs to be more community service amongst our police departments and, and giving back and going back. I know that there's, I have friends who are police officers and they do, and they do, they do give back. They do actually uh, participate in a lot of sports leagues and, and they're coaches of uh, sports leagues and they, they, they've, they've been there. They're, they're, they're not all of them, but I think that they, that, that needs to change that. We, we need to make sure that they have, they're involved in that community. Uh, we, in Prince George's County, we do have a pol community policing method uh, that, that it, for each, Every, for each community, they usually have a, one officer that is assigned to that community that talks to neighbors and goes and goes to community meetings, and they know them by name. Um, I was just at a recent civic association where the, the residents there knew the officer by, by his first name and has a cell phone number where they can call and talk to them uh, too. So they, so the Prince George County is actually doing not a bad, not having a, this community serve this community um, policing method has really been impressive to the extent that. Baltimore City is contacting Prince George's County on how to implement a better community pol community, community policing effort. Uh, but I do think there's more work that needs to be done, and 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 we need to, we need to do much much more. So I'm, I'm gonna yield there. See a question right here. I don't know. I may be going microphone. <laughs> That's all you got? <laughs> I totally agree with you that it has to be a multi-pronged attack. But there's something 
in this multi-pronged attack which is often ignored. And that is the warped thinking that underlies this whole situation. When Rudy Giuliani compares the black and black crime with few officers killing some black kids, what he forgets it, that if his son was in an accident and the surgeon, instead of healing him, kills him, will he compare that to all the murders that have been committed in the United States? When somebody whose role is to protect and defend you becomes the killer, that's not to be compared to the confirmed criminals committing crime on other people. And we have to stop any time anybody makes a comment like that, and we feel that it is stupid. It's, it's like no brainer that you have no <laughs> rationale underneath. We need to speak up. I'm Comfort, and I'm the mother of Emmanuel Kutuga that was murdered by um, Officer Christopher Jordan of Montgomery County. What is your, I, I totally agree with you, Kamal, because the issue of uh, transparency, black on black crime, when a black person do kill another bl black person, go to jail. But in this case, police officers are getting away with murder. The, uh, the mother of my son was actually captured on a video camera. And the state attorney, you know, just like you said, Mariam, with their comrades issue, said somebody mistakenly deleted the video. And that's why my, my case was thrown out of court. So on the issue of transparency, you know, how do you relate to what happened in Baltimore? State attorney Bosnia, they keep telling me it's not uh, constitutional. Is it constitutional to murder my son? And she actually requested for external professional investigators. Although we do get an indictment, but uh, conviction is another story. But we have, we have to start from somewhere. How do you relate to that? That is the <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I just no. can't. I can't stomach it. That the murder, the execution style of my son was actually captured in a video. I understand the comrades between the uh, state attorney and the prosecutor. But somebody mistakenly deleted it. The evidence. And, you know, comfort, to be honest, you, you're asking me to give an explanation for something that is just unexplainable, you know, um, and inexcusable and unjustifiable. Um, I, I cannot think of any, I can't think of any good reason that would give you any comfort, I don't to use your name, in the explanation. But there's, there's just no explanation. It's, it's outrageous. It is just outrageous. I just want to make a comment, but one of the things that I find interesting, and again, we're fighting for, a, not fighting literally, but we're trying to get a lot of uh, different bills passed and, and laws changed, et cetera. And it was interesting to me when we sat there trying to get an independent prosecutor that, you know, it was voted down. But you look at the indictments for the six officers in Baltimore and the FOP comes forward and says my officers are not guilty. So they are allowed to go to trial, as you mentioned, Comfort, and, and let it be determined. But they have already come out and said they want an independent prosecutor. And I felt that very interesting, but they shot down and voted down or testified against having an independent prosecutor when a police officer kills a civilian. Bob? Yeah, I'd like to ask a question about something I, I haven't heard. Right? Okay. I'll try it from here. Is that all right? Okay. I wanted to ask a question about something that I hadn't heard. Um, now, I did hear about 
20 uh, some bills and the categories and you know I s of course support all of them and but it occurred to me that you could have all those bills pass and you still might have bigoted racist arrogant police officers who are now afraid to do the wrong thing but we should aspire to more than that and I'm sure that the ACLU is also supporting police training and I didn't want the evening to go by without mentioning it, because if that's not a piece of the solution, then we're not aspiring to enough. And just to, <laughs> just to, to mention, uh, just back on May 9th, um, we had the Million Moms March, where we had mothers from across the country come together and had a meeting with um, White House uh, officials, of course, uh, President Obama, nor. First Lady Michelle Obama was there, nor did they send a statement, but they sent in, in a representative. Um, Comfort was also there. And, you know, those are some of the things that we talked about. We talked about, you know, what are the demands were that we were asking of the president, the demands that we were asking of the Department of Justice if we are to bring about change and greater police accountability. And in that was training, sensitivity training. I mean, officers are trained to shoot to kill. There was, um, a task force that Comfort was a part of, and we had a follow-up meeting two weeks after we met with the White House officials where they identified recommendations that they're asking to be implemented across the police departments, um, again, across the United States. And again, there was some changes to the training, but we're yet to see um, whether or not that is in fact implement, implemented or not. One of the discouraging things that I found um, when we met with the White House uh, officials was that you know, I went in there thinking, well, you know, Mr. President, why don't you just do an executive order and just, you know, request these changes to find that, again, it's going to take us in the changes um, to change laws to be able to get these police departments to do what is right and what is just. Okay. All right. Uh, want to take advantage of the political expertise up here and certainly in Annapolis. Uh, um, I'm looking for, uh, do you see any common ground with the governor uh, in terms of being, uh, let's see, things that you can work with that would support the kind of rights we're talking about? I can think of two issues on the left and two on the right where we talk, where the police are too much involved in life and they're causing a lot of problems. On the left, uh, the thing that you already are working on, which is trying to reduce the number of drug crimes that are just massive incarceration. Uh, likewise, everything related to immigration enforcement. Uh, on the right, the two big issues um, that are brought, uh, that these police are involved in, are Second Amendment seizures and asset forfeiture for profit. Anything that you can work with the governor on that, uh, or, or maybe that he's interested in working this, this General Assembly did pass a, um, a couple of measures looking at mass incarceration uh, that the governor signed um, and just looking at uh, ways for when uh, folks are going through reentry uh, that they can, that they can reenter into society and actually get a job was the uh, Second Chance Act um, that the governor signed uh, not too long ago and uh, that, was, that was supported by Democrats and Republicans. Uh, that he signed. So that was a way of compromising. Um, unfortunately, this governor uh, did not meet us halfway on the ensuring that uh, ex-felons were able to vote, uh, where there's 40 to 60,000 uh, ex-felons in our state who can who will be eligible to vote under this bill, and now they won't be able to be eligible to vote because this governor uh, vetoed that bill uh, this past year. Um, Delegate Cormac Cray, who was the lead sponsor on that bill, and myself uh, issued an op-ed in the Baltimore Sun uh, saying that this governor has really stepped out of his way to, you know, he went to Baltimore City and promised that, you know, that they, they, he was going to work together with folks and try to expand opportunities. And this is, a, this is one where he's, he, he's, he said to 40,000 people in Maryland that you, you, no long, you will not be able to vote here in Maryland. You have to wait a significant amount of time before you are eligible to vote again. Although you're you're contributing to society, although you're you, you're a taxpaying citizen, and you might even have kids that are in the school system. And um, you know, next year, I'm hopeful that the governor will see this uh, side by side. We'll see. We'll come to some type of um, uh, we will come.
come to some type of amenable conclusion to end some of these police accountability bills. Um, I'm going to ask ACLU to talk on some of those things that they believe that, that we can come to a compromise on. And now, you know, I'm glad you mentioned uh, civil asset forfeiture because actually uh, Jamie Raskin, Senator Raskin, had a bill uh, to curb the practice of civil asset forfeiture. Sorry, the mic is getting a tug here. Mary, is that you? And the governor vetoed it, you know. So uh, I'm not sure that that one is going to be really the basis for common ground, but I think the point that you're making is, is a really important one. And, you know, I think it's important for us to sort of pull the lens back you know, we're here to talk about police reform and police accountability, but, you know, I, I think we would be sorely misguided if we thought that reforming the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights or um, any sort of uh, sub-issue of police accountability is going to really solve all our problems. You know, we, we have to look at housing. We have to look at education reform. We have to look at uh, job opportunities. So, so there's this really broad range of issues that we have to address, and we have to think of things really comprehensively, I think. You know, um, Freddie Gray is, and I was, I was telling Meredith earlier, it, I, I think in, in many ways just the minor's canary for all the other social injustices we are seeing. And, you know, if we, um, we really have to recalibrate the way we think of, uh, you know, an erosion of school funding, you know, like that is, that is, that is violent. It might not feel that sort of sudden and, um, mm -hmm. and jarring as Freddie Gray's, you know, death, but it, you know, these are sort of subtle and steady, and if we are not careful, very unnoticeable forms of violence that we have to be um, that we have to be addressing and not allowing to sort of just slip by us. So, um, so thank you for your question. I know you're leaving. Was it a terrible answer? <laughs> <laughs> I have to run the counterclockwise. Your mind. Yeah. Look, let's not let's not get this uh, twisted. Uh, the governor, even if we pass this uh, LBER or we pass it independent. Um, police investigations. This governor is not going to sign this bill. I mean, he's not going to sign either and let it. He's going to let it follow through, or we're going to come back and have to override his veto. So let's not get it. Look, we want to meet halfway. We want to make sure our Republican colleagues and people and other who have other perspectives on these issues are heard. But at the same time, we got to we have to understand that you know this governor is he's a Republican governor. He's a conservative Republican. And he is not going to sign all these bills that we want to get through. So we're going to have to push through and the next year come back and override those vetoes and make sure we get the amount of votes that we can to get those things through. And speaking of the social issues, this governor decided, even after this issue with, uh, with Freddie Gray that happened in Baltimore City, to cut funding for a school system of 11, 11 to 13 million dollars from, from Baltimore City School. They had to lay off 150 teachers recently. And that's not helping the social issues that are occurring in that city. We had, Prince George's County had to take $20 million cut from our school system. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to cut teachers just as well because we don't have the adequate funding for the high percentage of, of, uh, of kids who are in poverty right now. We have one of the highest rates of poverty in our school system in the state of Maryland, and this governor decided to cut $20 million of that. The same with Montgomery County. They cut $17 million from Montgomery County. And this this isn't a cut that will go towards something else. This is money that's just going to sit there. But how much did they approve for prisons? <laughs> exactly. That's the other, that's the other part of the equation. Yeah. Exactly. I understand. $30 million was approved for a youth prison in Baltimore. Right. Right. No, absolutely. I, I, I totally agree. Those those things, things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I agree. Thank you. Well, let's give another round of applause to our panelists. <laughs> what are we gesturing? We have a petition. Um, is that we have a petition for police accountability? We'd like everyone to sign. Did you have it? Did you have it? Oh, just an announcement. Okay, an announcement. <laughs> All right, so this announcement applies to anyone who lives in Prince George's County, or even if you don't live in Prince George's County, uh, particularly uh, here, uh, Delegate Joe Valerio is a representative out of Prince George's in District 23, yeah. and so I'm working with a group of young people uh, uh, called Team Next Step, uh, that's a collective of youth activists that are going to be working to engage in his district, uh, talking to his constituents about his opposition to police reform. And if you would like to help with that, 
uh, either by helping to visit churches, uh, to talk to his constituents there, or going to community events or door to door. We're gonna be going canvassing on June 27th uh, in the morning. I can get you more information about that. Just see me or Jonathan Hutto and we'll let you know how to get involved. I'm down with it. <laughs> <laughs> more announcements. Uh, really short. <laughs> I'm Amy from the ACLU. I just um, was hoping that you guys could um, say one or two discreet or specific things that everybody in this room could do um, to help um, with our goals in Annapolis this year. And if part of that is kind of what we could do better next year, um, what you're hoping that you'll see in Annapolis this year that we didn't have last year. Um, I think that could be a good thing for all of us to go home and know like one or two things we could do um, that wouldn't take too much effort. The, the, one, the one thing I was going to say was that these are these are people who are working hard, leg legislators who uh, and who are working hard in Annapolis to get things done. And the one thing sometimes we don't hear is, you know, keep pushing, keep going. We need yeah. your help. We need to keep. We need to keep moving. And these are these are young people who are millennials and who are under the age of forty who are pushing for these bills. And most times, what we what we get encouraged by, we sometimes we get discouraged by leadership because they are leadership. And hearing from our constituents and hearing from other people that you are doing the right thing and that this you need to push further. And I'm going to have your back no matter what. Keep pushing forward. Keep pushing forward. That's important. That's what the ACLU did for me. They kept pushing me to really get the thing done and really keep on pushing me and telling me what strategies I need to take. And I was really appreciative of that. So I want to say uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that for ACLU. But that's one thing you can do that doesn't take much of an email saying, just do this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Call your legislators. It makes a difference. Before I started this work, I, you know, people would say, yeah, call your representative, call your delegate, call your senator. And you think, ah, oh, whatever. It's not really good. It makes a difference. I've walked into the legislator's office and they will say, oh yeah, two people, two people have called me about this issue. So that's how I'm, that is how I'm going to decide how to vote on this issue because they heard from two people. So um, it makes a difference. Uh, call your legislators. I just want to say one last thing. Sorry, it's an announcement because I, I saw some other folks giving announcements earlier and I can't, I, can't, I can't let this go. So on June 25th, uh, I'm hosting an event with my good friend Bill Orleans, who's back there. Bill, raise your hand. No, he doesn't want to raise his hand. It's okay. It's okay. But, but he's but he but we we we've come together and worked on. Uh, we're having an event called Color and Class. Uh, it's a racial discuss. It's a discussion on race, politics, and society uh, here in Greenbelt, the Greenbelt Community Center. Uh, I encourage you to go. You can go to AlonzoWashington.com uh, to look up the event. It's also been e so e blasted it. It's on my Facebook account too. Uh, we encourage you to come to have this open discussion on race class and um, and social issues in our county and this is an open discussion where we can really 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 can really get down to the, the issues of why our society has been divided based on those categories so I hope that you'll come June 25th at Greenbelt uh, Community Center thank you what time all right seven o'clock uh, Jonathan I don't have the details but can you give an announcement about the, the task force and the meeting this month on June 23rd oh, yes, there yes, too yes. Yes, sir. I should have brought the information on Mary. I'm sorry. So what wasn't mentioned today, I think Delegate Washington mentioned indirectly, is that because of the efforts of the people, right, the, the House Speaker, uh, Michael Bush, has announced a task force. Uh, I want to I call it, I'm, 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 I'm paraphrasing, Police Reform Task Force has several delegates on it. Uh, Delegate Pena, if I'm saying that correctly, she's one of the delegates on it. And so at the end of each month, there's an actual issue that's going to be talked about, debated, and discussed. They want to hear from community groups. They're going to hear from law enforcement groups, etc. On the 23rd of this month, they want, they're going to be talking about law enforcement hiring practices, right? At the end of the month in July, they're going to be talking about just general law enforcement issues. The end of August is Leobor, for example. So one of the things, for those that are on my email list and Facebook group, I'm going to email out that we're going to get a group of folks together to go up there on the 23rd and actually plug into that hearing and get our perspective across. Uh, so if you're not on my email list, you can give me your information. But if you're not on my email list, get on Larry's list, get on somebody's list, get ACLU's list, number of organizations in here, get on someone's list 
we're gonna get this information out. So, uh, uh, did I cover it, Mary? Did you I cover did. It? Thank you, Jonathan. Okay. Which leads to more discrete tasks people can do. Follow the ACLU of Maryland on Twitter, like it on Facebook, and you can get more information. Sign the petition for police accountability. Sign up. Okay, one more. Another <laughs> I just wanted to say something discreet we can do is to support Larry Lomax. Um, some of you may recognize him as the young black man with dreadlocks and an F the police shirt who was yanked to the ground, pepper sprayed directly in his face, then yanked to the ground and dragged across the pavement. I um, protested the curfew less than five minutes after him, and I was only detained for less than 24 hours. I was not charged with anything, but Larry Lomax was held for almost a month, um, and he, Larry Lomax was originally charged with assaulting an officer. If you look on Google, you can watch for yourself. There's video footage of what happened from many angles. It's very clear that he was not threatening or hurtful to anyone, um, but he was hurt. And he was held for almost a month, and I can say two numbers for anyone who can write them down, but we need to call the state's attorney's office, 410-878-8170. You can actually leave a message from Murphy Hartford. All you need to say is, I've seen the video footage, drop all the charges. The only one that remains now is disorderly conduct against Larry Lomax. But um, I think all the phone calls that were made before um, led, had something to do, a little something to do with them dropping the most obviously false ones, like accusing him of assaulting an officer. But he's, he still has to face court. So if you can call that number, 410-878-8170, and just leave a message um, saying, you've seen the footage, he wasn't threatening or hurting anyone, and um, the disorderly charge, all the charges against Larry Lomax need to be dropped. Thank you. Thank you to the New Deal Cafe, and thank you to all of you for coming.